time now for a new occasional series for Songs of Praise. Richard Taylor, author and church historian, has been digging into the links between famous literary figures and some of our great places of worship. He starts in Stratford-upon-Avon with William Shakespeare. Holy Trinity Stratford is such a striking, pretty church and it couldn't be more personal to Shakespeare. His mother, his father, his son, many of his friends are buried here in the churchyard. He was baptised here, he worshipped here, he's buried here. And it makes you wonder, what was it like in Shakespeare's day? What did he experience and could it have influenced what he wrote? Your imagination starts racing as soon as you step into the church. Just take a look at this 13th century door knocker, which Shakespeare would have passed every time he came here. Look at its flat, grimacing face. Are we looking at Caliban from The Tempest? But there's also a clue here of something else, something darker. If you look over your head, this roundel once showed maybe Christ in majesty, but someone has come along and smashed it to pieces. What happened here? I'm meeting up with Shakespeare expert Dr Paul Edmondson to find out more. Elizabeth I inherited turmoil when she came to the throne. The country had been Protestant, then it was Catholic, but it was also a time of the rise of Puritanism as well. Destructive Puritanism? Yes, the defacing of the images which happened here in the Holy Trinity Church. Shakespeare's father had to oversee that. And maybe Shakespeare saw the theatre as a way of putting back the image which had gone from the churches. What was Shakespeare's attitude to faith? Shakespeare never preaches in any of the plays. He wants to present us with big questions about our existence. He alludes to the Bible lots of times. But then you have Lear on the Heath, you have Hamlet asking whether it's better to be or not to be. And then suddenly he'll zone in on the small detail of the natural world. A wren's eye of pity in Cymbelina, the tender horns of cockled snails in Love's Labour's Lost. There's something incarnational going on there. The church still holds these seats for the monks to sit on during prayers and underneath the seats are these misericords, little ledges that they would lean on during long services and underneath the misericords are these wild carvings which Shakespeare would have been very familiar with. And just look at this fellow with his great curved horns and pointed ears. Could this be the model for Puck? from A Midsummer Night's Dream? Or back there, this woman holding onto her husband's beard as she's about to whack him with a frying pan. Is this the taming of the shrew? Here in the sanctuary is a bust of Shakespeare put up by his family and friends. And beneath it is his grave with this inscription. Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Shakespeare's final words, that in the end, this place is where he wanted to stay forever. Shall I compare thee? Our summer's day, thy art more lovely ooh, and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the dying buds of May, and summer's leaves have thought to short a date. So long as May. Often his gold ooh, 
complexion do And every fair from fair sometimes decline A chance of nature's changing course of trend So long as man can breathe All right But thy eternal summer shall not fade Nor lose possession of thy fair thou always So long as man can breathe Or rest can see So long lives there Later in the programme, we'll be meeting volunteers from the UK who are taking aid and Christian literature across to the migrant camp in Calais. And after the next hymn, David Grant catches up with Grammy Award winner Matt Redman. St John's Wood, London, home to the most famous music studio in the world. 
It's also the place where I'm meeting up with worship leader and Grammy Award winner Matt Redman, who's recorded his latest album here. After starting at the tender age of 14, Matt's gone on to pen some of the most popular songs in modern Christian music. Millions sing his inspirational ballads and he regularly performs to tens of thousands of people across the globe. The job of a worship leader is to help people connect with God through music. Yeah. You know, that's what I think about when I'm writing songs, that's what I'm trying to do when I'm on the stage. So when you come off stage, are you Matt Redman, worship leader, or are you <laughs> somebody else? I'm probably a bit more reserved and shy than people would think. Yeah. And shorter. You know, <laughs> something about the stage it makes you look a bit taller than you are. With a string of hits based on his strong faith, Matt's music has seen him achieve universal appeal. You know, for me, when I write a song, I want it to be poetic. Mm -hmm. I want it to be biblical, you know, and to reflect what's in scripture and how God portrays himself there. I want it to be congregational, so it's singing well, and I want it to be relevant. Within the music business, success is measured in many different ways. How do you measure success? Success isn't like, oh, we sold out 3,000 people here or I'll get to play this special venue. As I love that stuff, it's great, but success for me is like someone saying, your song helped me in a time of trouble or trial in my life. Your song helped me convey something or, or pray to God. And I didn't have the words, but your song gave me the words to do that. For me, that's, that's what I love to hear. Some of the most beautiful moments are when everyone's become one choir, you know, the band, the singers, the people in the room, and we're singing one song, in a sense, to, to God. I love that. 